Jacques René Hébert was a French journalist, and the founder and editor of the extreme radical newspaper Le Père du Chien during the French Revolution. His followers are usually referred to as the Ebertists or the Ebertists. He himself is sometimes called Père du Chien, after his newspaper, Early Life. Jacques René Hébert studied law at the College of Alonson and went into practice as a clerk in a solicitor of Alonson, at which time he was ruined by a lawsuit against a drive, Clouet. Hébert fled first to Rouen and then to Paris. For a while he passed through a difficult financial time and lived through the support of a hairdresser in Rue des Noyers. There he found work in a theatre, La République, where he wrote plays in his spare time, but these were never produced. He was fired for stealing. He then entered the service of a doctor. It is said he lived through expediency and scams. In 1789, he began his writing with a pamphlet, La Lanterne Madremola FLE Acute AU des Aristocratis. He published a few booklets. In 1790, he attracted attention through a pamphlet he published and became a prominent member of the Club of the Cordeliers in 1791, Père Duchesne. Ebert's influence was mainly due to his articles in his journal, Le Père Duchesne, which appeared from 1790 to 1794. The first publication of Le Père du Chain occurred in September 1790 and opened a new period in his life. His polemical articles were written with wit but were also violent and abusive, and purposely couched in foul language in order to appeal to the sans culottes. Street hawkers would yell, Il est bougement en col aujourd'hui le père du chien. They were written in first-person narrative style from Père Duchin's point of view, and often contained fictitious accounts of conversations between the character and the French monarchy or government officials. Père Duchin's appearance as a bristly old man with pipe and liberty cap contrasted sharply against the crown and aristocracy's formal attire. This enabled the general population of France to more easily relate to the character, giving his words increased strength. Initially, from 1790 to 1791, Le Père Duchesne supported a constitutional monarchy and was even favorable towards King Louis XVI and the opinions of the Marquis de Lafayette. His violent attacks of the period were aimed at Jean Suffrine Maury a great defender of papal authority and the main opponent of the civil constitution of the clergy. With the king's failed flight to Varennes, his tone significantly hardened. Starting in 1792, the Paris Commune and the ministers of war Jean-Nicolas Paca and, later, Jean-Baptiste Noel Bouchotter bought several thousand copies of Le Père du Chien which were distributed free to the public and troops. Knowing that the Queen was an easy target for ridicule after the diamond necklace affair, she became a consistent target in the paper. He referred to Marie Antoinette as Madame Vito and addressed Louis XVI as a drunken and lazy, a cuckolded pig. His venomous attacks on Marie Antoinette were not entirely out of hatred for the Queen, at least not initially. Originally, Hébert was trying to not only educate his readers who she was but simultaneously awaken her to how she was viewed by the French public. Many of the conversations that Père Duchesne carries with her in the newspaper are attempts at either showcasing her supposed nymphomania or attempts to beg her to reconcile her wicked ways. Revolutionary Role On 17 July 1791, Hébert was at the Champter Mars to sign a petition to demand the removal of King Louis XVI and was involved with the subsequent Champter Mars massacre by troops under Lafayette. This put him in the revolutionary mindset, and the Le Père du Chien adopted a sloppier style to better to appeal to the masses. Le Père du Chien began to attack Lafayette, Mirabeau, and Bailey. Following Louis's failed flight to Varennes, he began to attack both Louis and Pope Pius VI as well. Hébert met to his future wife Marie Gopal, a 37-year-old former nun who had left convent life at the Sisters of Providence Convent at Rue Saint-Honoré. Marie's passport from this time shows regular use. 
They married on 7 February 1792, and had a daughter, Virginia Scipion Ebert. During this time, Ebert had a luxurious, bourgeois life. He entertained Jean-Nicolas Packer, the mayor of Paris and minister of war, for weeks, as well as other influential men, and liked to dress elegantly and surround himself with beautiful objects as beautiful tapestries, an attitude that can be contrasted to that of Pierre Gaspard Chaumet. Where he got the financial resources to support his lifestyle is unclear, however, there are Jean-Nicolas Packer's commissions to print thousands of issues of Le Père du Chêne and his relationship to de Lune d'Anges, mistress and wife of Andrés Maria de Guzman. As a member of Cordelia's club, he had a seat in the revolutionary Paris Commune where on the 9th and 10th of August, 1792 he was sent to the Bonne Nouvelle section of Paris. As a public journalist, he supported the September massacres. On the 22nd of December 1792, he was appointed the second substitute of the procureur of the commune, and through to August 1793 supported the attacks against the Girondin faction. In April May 1793 he, along with Marat and others, violently attacked Girondins. In February 1793, he voted with fellow bourgeois Ebertists against the Maximum Price Act, a price ceiling on grain, on the grounds it would cause hoarding and stir resentment. On 20 May 1793 the moderate majority of the National Convention formed the Special Commission of Twelve, which was designed to investigate and prosecute conspirators. At the urging of the Twelve on 24 May 1793 he was arrested. However, Ebert had been warned in time, and, with the support of the sans culottes the National Convention was forced to order his release three days later. Reign of Terror in Campaign to Dechristianize France between May 31, June 2, 1793, Paris sections, encouraged by the enraged Jacques Roux and Jacques Hébert, protested outside the convention, calling for administrative and political purges, a low fixed price for bread, and a limitation of the electoral franchise to sans culottes alone. With the backing of the National Guard, they convinced the convention to arrest 31 Girondin leaders, including Jacques Pierre Brissot. Following these arrests, the Jacobins gained control of the Committee of Public Safety on 10 June, installing the revolutionary dictatorship. On 13 July the assassination of Jean-Paul Marat, a Jacobin leader and journalist known for his aggressive rhetoric, by Charlotte Corday. A Girondin resulted in further increase of Jacobin political influence. Georges Danton, the leader of August 1792 uprising against the king, was removed from the committee. On 27 July, Maximilien Robespierre, known as the Incorruptible, made his entrance, and quickly became the most influential member of the committee as it moved to take radical measures against the revolution's domestic and foreign enemies. Meanwhile, on 24 June, the Convention adopted the first Republican Constitution of France, the French Constitution of 1793. It was ratified by public referendum, but never put into force, like other laws. It was indefinitely suspended by the decree of October that the government of France would be revolutionary until the peace. The eventual constitution under the directory was quite different. Facing local revolts, foreign invasions and riots in both the east and west of the country, the most urgent government business was the war. On 17 August, the convention voted for general conscription, the levée en masse, which mobilized all citizens to serve as soldiers or suppliers in the war effort. On 5 September the convention institutionalized the reign of terror systematic and lethal repression of perceived enemies within the country. The result was policy through which the state used violent repression to crush resistance to the government. The guillotine became the symbol of a string of executions. Louis XVI had already been guillotined before the start of the terror. Marie Antoinette, the Girondins, Philippe Galate, Madame Roland and many others lost their lives under its blade. 
The Revolutionary Tribunal summarily condemned thousands of people to death by the guillotine, while mobs beat other victims to death. Sometimes people died for their political opinions or actions, but many for little reason beyond mere suspicion, or because some others had a stake in getting rid of them. Most of the victims received an unceremonious trip to the guillotine in an open wooden cart. Loaded onto these carts, the victims would proceed through throngs of jeering men and women. The victims of the Reign of Terror totaled approximately 50,000. Among people who were condemned by the revolutionary tribunals, about 8% were aristocrats, 6% clergy, 4% middle class, and 72% were workers or peasants accused of hoarding, evading the draft, desertion, rebellion, and other purported minimal crimes. Of these social groupings, the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church suffered proportionately the greatest loss. Another anti-clerical uprising was made possible by the installment of the revolutionary calendar on October 24. Against Robes Peer's concepts of deism and virtue, Ebert's atheist movement initiated a religious campaign in order to de-Christianize society. The program of de-Christianization waged against Catholicism, and eventually against all forms of Christianity, included the deportation of clergy and the condemnation of many of them to death, the closing of churches, the institution of revolutionary and civic cults, the large-scale destruction of religious monuments, the outlawing of public and private worship and religious education, forced marriages of the clergy and forced abjurement of their priesthood. The enactment of a law on 21 October 1793 made all suspected priests and all persons who harbored them liable to death on sight. The climax was reached with the celebration of the goddess Reason in Notre Dame Cathedral on 10 November. Because dissent was now regarded as counter-revolutionary, extremist and rageous such as Eber and moderate Montagnard indulgent such as Danton were guillotined in the spring of 1794. On 7 June Robes Pierre, who had previously condemned the cult of reason, advocated a new state religion and recommended that the convention acknowledge the existence of God. On the next day, the worship of the deistic supreme being was inaugurated as an official aspect of the revolution. Compared with Ebbett's somewhat popular festivals, this austere new religion of virtue was received with signs of hostility by the Parisian public. Clash with Robes Pierre, arrest, conviction, and execution. After successfully attacking the Girondins, he continued to attack others whom he viewed as too moderate, including Danton, Filippo, and Robes Pierre in the fall of 1793. The government, with support from the Jacobins, was exasperated and finally decided to strike on the night of 13 March 1794. Despite the reluctance of Barret de Vuzac, Collip der Bois and Billard Verena, the order was to arrest the leaders of the Ebertists. These included individuals in the war ministry and others. In the revolutionary tribunal, Ebert was treated very differently from Danton. More like a thief than a conspirator, his earlier scams were brought to light and criticized. He was sentenced to death with his co-defendants on the third day of deliberations. Their execution by guillotine took place on 24 March 1794. Ebert's executioners amused the crowd by adjusting the guillotine so that its blade stopped inches above his neck. Only on the fourth attempt was the execution carried out. His corpse was disposed of in the Madeleine Cemetery. His widow was executed 20 days later on 13 April 1794. Her corpse was disposed of in the Erinsis Cemetery. Influence Ebert's influence within the French Revolution due to his publication Le Père Duchesne had a strong impact on the outcomes of certain political events. A majority of the political decisions that occurred during the Revolution were a culmination of small events over time.
Solar Perduction's ability to influence the general population of France was indeed notable, along with his ability to manipulate his readers' perceptions of the revolution. He manipulated the way they perceived the king and queen. On the day that Marie Antoinette was on trial, Hébert himself spoke, alleging that she had committed incest with her own son, which sealed her fate in the eyes of the court. Gallery Illustration from the Père Duchesne Broadsides, a letter by Jacques Hébert to citizen Pierre-François Palois.